Hello and welcome to Getting Started with Industrial ICS OT Cybersecurity. I appreciate you taking the time to check the video out and, and hopefully you'll find uh, some good information and resources that you're looking for, maybe some answers to your questions about literally how to get started in industrial cybersecurity. So my name is Mike Holcomb and uh, again, I appreciate you for uh, wanting to come check out the uh, class. So real quickly, a couple of disclaimers. So the information that I'm gonna be sharing is informational purposes only, and that all the information that you are going to learn is expected to be used for the forces of good and not for the, the forces of evil. You know, ideally, we're gonna be talking about things like different cybersecurity attacks against industrial control and IT environments and how to conduct those different types of attacks. So we learn this information, we share this information to make ourselves better cybersecurity defenders. And that's the really the main goal of this course. So not to use that information to become an attacker. So hopefully everybody gets the, the idea there and then all the information I discuss in the course is really my own opinions. It's not necessarily affiliated with my day job or any of the other organizations that uh, or clients that I'm affiliated with. So, so I did include this slide that I usually keep this in or use this slide when I'm doing this class live. And so we've had, I think, about a thousand people come through this this course live uh, over the last year. So this, which is really exciting, uh, and also wanted to get it out on on YouTube for those that that couldn't make the the classes. But uh, and we'll be talking about uh, Rob Lee probably a lot <laughs> throughout the course. And you know, Rob Lee, if you're not familiar, so Rob Lee is the CEO and founder of Dragos, and they are the world leader in industrial control cybersecurity. And that's really because Rob Lee is considered the, the true thought leader at the, the global level in industrial control cybersecurity. His mentor, Michael Asante, who had passed away unfortunately a couple of years ago, but he really was seen as the person that really started the field of industrial cybersecurity. So we have this incredible lineage that uh, between Michael Asante and and, Rob, and many others that we're going to be talking about through through the course, but Rob's probably the the one person we'll mention most uh, as as we go along. And I have a lot of you know share stories that he shared um, that that I'm able to you know share with everyone. If if it's something that he shared like in a class or in a speech, um, you know, it's definitely there's other things that he shared in the past that are only for you know for it's not my place to share those things, but but definitely the the ones that, that I'm able to, I think it helps really bring a lot of light and character into some of the, the shadows of, of ICS cybersecurity. And he really does an incredible job of demystifying ICS cybersecurity, which I've always appreciated it, uh, trying to make it simple and practical for people to understand. And that's really one of my goals as well. So uh, so in larger groups, when you have a couple hundred people in Discord, we like to <laughs> say, you do you, just don't be a, a jerk, you know, so so be a, be a, be nice to everyone. But again, I just, so I just kept it in there just to really introduce Rob Lee that, uh, again, we'll be talking about him uh, uh, more than a few times, I'm sure, as we go throughout the course. So what we're going to be covering uh, in this first section, so we're going to talk about uh, a little bit, uh, give you a little bit about my background, so maybe understand why you should or maybe shouldn't listen to me. Uh, we'll talk about you know the purpose of the course, why I put it together, the goals of ultimately what you're going to look at getting out of the course. Uh, we're going to have some references and course materials that, that we'll be looking at. Uh, we'll go over the different units or modules that make up the course. And then we'll wrap up with a discussion on cybersecurity certifications for ICSOT, because that's one of the most common questions that I get. So we want to put that in this introduction section, because it really doesn't fit in, in any of the other modules. And then we'll also talk about some additional resources like conferences and podcasts that, that you can either attend or, or listen to to get a lot of great information uh, on industrial control cybersecurity.
So for those of you that don't know me, my name's Mike Holcomb. I'm the Floor Fellow for Cybersecurity. Uh, so I work at a company called Floor. We're one of the world's largest engineering and construction companies in the world. So we build and sometimes operate some of the world's largest industrial control environments. And I get to work with some of the best engineers in the world, which, which is really um, fascinating you know, position to be in because I can learn so much from, from so many different people and from all over the world and all different types of companies and all different sectors. So we'll be talking about, uh, I'll share as much of that experience as, as I can throughout the course as well. I'm also the global lead for the floor ICSOT cybersecurity perspective, uh, program or practice, if you want. So we'll talk a little bit more as we're going throughout the course and what that really means from a practical experience. I also run a couple of uh, local cybersecurity groups. So I run the, the local ISSA chapter, which is more associated with IT cybersecurity. I've been doing that for almost 20 years at this point. And uh, also the local version of uh, B-Sides that we have here in Greenville. So we'll also be talking about those as, as we go uh, throughout the course. Uh, I also wrote and taught all of the six cybersecurity courses that make up the local technical college's cybersecurity program, uh, which I was really proud of because there are a lot of really hands-on, you know, true like practical experience, hands-on labs that they put in the, the courses. So I was really, really excited and, and, and proud of that work. I have a lot of cybersecurity certifications. You know, I've been uh, in IT cybersecurity for a little over 25 years, and I've been you know, working into getting into OT cybersecurity since 2010. So not as long, but uh, uh, for about what 13 years when I started, and it was really I didn't get really a lot of traction until about 10 years ago into the field. So that's another reason why I put this course together to to help people that want to make that transition, whether it's from IT cybersecurity or if you're an OT today and, and want to learn more about cybersecurity. So, so we'll be talking about some of those certifications. I'm actually finishing up my master's degree right now. I'm writing my thesis on kind of PLC cybersecurity, uh, which those are programmable logic controllers. If you don't know what that means yet, you will after the next section or suit two, so don't worry about that. Uh, so, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about that and, and the thesis, and and uh, and then I do some outside training and consulting uh, outside of the floor world as well. So I've worked with a couple manufacturing entities now and some other uh, really small, well, more medium to large size environments. So that uh, I've been really fortunate and lucky to, to work with. Yeah, so I'm really, really happy about getting to do uh, all those different projects. I just like going into new environments and, and working with people and, and helping them become secure. So uh, in my, my floor world, in the OT, or the operational technology or industrial control side, uh, so you can see in the upper left, that was actually my first project I actually got to go on site for. It was a large traditional power plant that actually uses natural gas to, to generate electricity. So we're going to be actually be talking about uh, that uh, project as an example of how a overall industrial site comes together using the, the power plant example. So I worked on the new New York Bridge. Not not a lot of control systems on bridges. There's there's some, but uh, uh, so it's still is an exciting project. That's north of New York City and the bridge that goes over to uh, the Jersey side. So uh, we run the subways in, in several big cities in the United States. Uh, one that I recently have worked with is in Denver, Colorado. So if those of you not familiar, Denver is kind of right in the middle of the United States. So uh, that was uh, that was their uh, their picture there. And then in the kind of the lower left is our largest project that we're building for Shell, which is called Shell LNGC. It's a uh, LNG. Uh, port facilities who so bring in uh, natural gas, liquefy it, and load it onto container ships. And it's actually Shell's largest project as well. It's a $50 billion project just to kind of get an idea of size and scope. And when you look at that picture, the idea is it doesn't maybe look that big, but it's really, it's, I, you say it's kind of like a small city. It's really more like a medium sized city. The the LNG storage tank, which you can kind of see in the bottom, where it still has the cranes around it as they are building it, 
but and I remember talking about this as part of the risk assessment, and we'll, we'll get into that later in the course. But talk about the the storage tank that is lined with sensors because you have to monitor over time because natural gas can become unstable and and could explode. And when you look at the tank itself, it's actually the size of a large sports stadium. So it's a little hard to tell maybe from the scale of the picture, but that then starts to, you can really maybe start to get an idea of how large that, that project actually is. So, but that gives you a little bit of background. I work on some other projects, of course, as well. And a few will talk about uh, anything that's publicly available uh, that you know, I'm definitely free and, and open to, to talk about. So. so that's a little bit about me. And uh, real quickly, uh, if you haven't seen, most people find me through LinkedIn. So definitely feel free to reach out and follow. You can reach out and connect, send, send me a message. If you have questions on the course material, usually at LinkedIn is the best way to get a hold of me. So so you can find me there. I'm always I'm always there. So so that's the one place that's better than email even, uh, or my cell phone probably, the, to get a hold of me. Uh, you can also see in the little banner, I did write two different little eBooks that are free and about getting started in industrial cybersecurity. And one is actually written for those of you that are coming from an IT cybersecurity background. And if you're coming from an OT uh, automation background, then there's a, a version that's written for you. So so probably about 80% of the content is about the same. It's just the, the first 15, 20% of the content where depending on which world you come from, the steps that you're going to take first to get into cybersecurity, industrial controls, is, is different. And so the books you know, really can help you walk through that process and, and just provide a lot of resources and, and kind of thoughts on, on how best to go about getting into industrial cybersecurity. And for, for me, in 2010, when Stuxnet first came out, and we'll talk more about that later on, that was really what started getting me down that path into industrial cybersecurity. The problem was nobody wanted to talk about it back then. There really weren't any books. There was very little information on the Internet. So it was a very... Uh, you know, black magic that nobody knew, you know, how it actually worked. And, and sometimes it can be like that even today. Thankfully, especially over the last couple of years and, and a lot of the work by people like Michael Asante and Rob Lee, you know, the community has really opened up over the, the last couple of years. And, and there's still a lot of great information out there, but it can still also be overwhelming. Again, that's a big part of why I put those books together and why I put this class together. So ultimately, why the class though, and, and why am I in industrial cybersecurity, and, and why today? So this, and right now I'm recording this, it's November of 2023, so 2024 is coming very quickly. The industrial control cybersecurity landscape has changed dramatically over the last couple of years especially the last couple of years and, and even the last couple of months. Whereas prior to really 2021, 20, that really not much had changed for years, for decades. And so it's a really exciting space to be in right now because things, things are really starting to change. And for us as defenders, not, not in a good way, unfortunately, because we are seeing the number of attacks are going up every year. They're doubling, they're tripling against our OT or industrial control environments and in some more sensitive environments. Like if you're in the Ukraine, that you know, they're seeing you know, anywhere from 10 to 100 fold increases, depending on the, the day of the week. Just you know, insane amounts of increases of attacks against things like critical infrastructure. What we really saw was a big shift, and this goes about two and a half years ago with the Colonial Pipeline breach, which we're going to talk a lot more about in, in course, and you'll hear me mention it a, a lot as really this kind of demarcation point for the in control system cybersecurity. Because before Colonial Pipeline, about two and a half years ago, not everybody in OT really worried about cybersecurity. 
they were just worried about nation state attackers. But Colonial Pipeline wasn't taken offline because of a nation state attacker like Russia or China or the United States. It was a ransomware group. And we normally associate ransomware groups with you know, general IT. And now we see ransomware as the number one threat against both IT and OT environments. So uh, there's a lot we're going to unpack there. So I don't want to jump too far ahead. But another problem that we see is that more and more, and this is just increasing every day, that the types of systems we have in IT, like Windows-based systems, are moving more and more into OT which makes it easier for us to run and manage facilities, but it also makes it that much easier for attackers. So not only are we seeing more attacks and more attackers, but we're also seeing more systems that are easy for the attackers to break into. We're also allowing a lot of, in my opinion, too much communication between the IT networks and the, the OT networks at a, at a location. And so if you're at, let's say, a power plant, or you have an IT side of the house and you have an OT side of the house, and you want to keep those as separated as possible, but it's not always as easy just to say they're completely you know, cut off from each other. That, that doesn't work. So we do allow some communication, but we have to do that as securely as possible. So we're going to be talking about that. We have an entire section dedicated to that later on. We also look at, so we're going to talk about owners and operators in the OT space. So owners are, this is a company that owns, let's say, like a power plant. So the, the power plant that I was mentioning earlier, that was owned by Dominion Energy. Now, the people that run the power plant, that keep it up and running, generating electricity for the public, that could be the same company. It could be Dominion Energy employees or they could, Dominion Energy could pay someone, another company, to run the power plant for them. So sometimes owners and operators can be different companies, or like I believe with the, the Dominion Energy power plant, they're the owners and they also operate the facility as well. But we still see a lot of owners and operators, even in 2023, don't think that their OT environments are targets, uh, which to me is probably one of the most concerning uh, problems that we have today. So a big part of what I work on is really, in a lot of respects, security awareness and helping owners and operators understand that that they are targets of attack. And it's, again, it's not just nation state attackers we're worried about anymore. So. And then ultimately, you know, why cybersecurity, especially in critical infrastructure, is so important is what happens with that power plant? If the power plant goes down for a couple of hours, yeah, not the end of the world. Right? As long as our iPhones and laptops have a couple hours on their battery, you know, we'll, we'll all survive. But what if it's a couple of days or a couple of weeks or, and then you get into really worst case, right? Months or year without power. I mean, that's where you get into walking dead territory, right? And, and the degradation of society. And that's obviously not what any of us wants. So in, in the IT world, I always focus on, I don't want the company compromised because if anything, the company loses money, people are going to lose their jobs. In OT or industrial control cybersecurity, there's even greater stakes when you talk about how we support the world around us. And that's a big focus for me. It's really, I don't say it lightly. I say, yeah, we're here literally to save the world or at least to protect the world sometimes from itself. You know, we want to make sure that, especially with critical infrastructure, power, water, right? A lot of these things that people take for granted. I, I know I do, right? That, that are protected and, and stay safe. So telecommunications, um, which plays into you know, the internet, right? Large data centers that provide services, manufacturing, think especially like with pharmaceuticals, so there's a lot that comes into play. So we'll, we'll be talking a lot about that as we go throughout the course. Now, the course itself, you can see that you know, when I put this together, it was really designed as this high-level overview of cybersecurity when it comes to industrial control environments. Like 
power plants or manufacturing or we talk about mining or rail or and the list goes on and on so we'll talk about a lot of different types of environments that's another thing i'm very fortunate about working at floors i get to work in so many types of, of environments there's very few different types of sectors we actually don't you know, don't work in and, and we work in just about every country on six continents i used to be on seven continents <laughs> so uh so we've you know, been a little bit all over. Uh, so again, I get to bring in a lot of experiences and, and knowledge from over the years to be able to share. So it's, this is not, of course, this is just a over, over, overview. Uh, and then like, just like in, in general IT cybersecurity, right? We're kind of scratching the surface and then there's different areas that you can dive deeper into. And hopefully as you're going throughout this course, you'll find those different areas that you're probably even more interested in and, and you can definitely take a, a deeper look at, at those. So uh, if you're you know, just even interested in, in learning a little bit about industrial control, cybersecurity, right? It's a great, great, uh, great course. And the nice thing with videos on YouTube is you could just kind of flip through it as much as you want. If you're not, you know, if you're not trying to really, you know, deep dig in and learn and you just kind of want to get a look and feel, right? Perfectly fine. Uh, and then it, really ultimately then it's also about you know, hel helping people understand how do we secure these control system environments? How do we protect our power plants and our water, water treatment facilities and our railways and our mines and our, our manufacturing environments and so on and so forth. A couple of the other goals, a couple of things that we'll highlight as we go throughout is we talk about how you know, with people coming from an IT background, which we already started to mention, is comes into control system cybersecurity differently than somebody from you know, the control system world. So people like people doing engineers or technicians at a site, maybe they're doing operations and maintenance or uh, doing things like PLC programming or work in a, a control room. But we'll be looking at, you know, how do people come from the IT world? How do people come from the OT world? But ultimately, it's not only how do we come from these different worlds, like I came from a traditional IT cybersecurity background, but how do I get to work with people on the engineering and the maintenance side of the house and the automation groups, right? Because it takes both sides of the house to work together because it's not just the IT side. It's not just the OT side of the house. We have to work together as if it's a bad marriage where we're either fighting all the time or we're just not even communicating and everybody's just shut down. Nothing's getting done. And the only people that win are the attackers. And that's the, the biggest concern. So one of the, the areas that I highlight that's most important for us to work in in industrial cybersecurity is how do we get OT and IT people to work together? And sometimes the best way to do that is to get them in the same class. And we'll be talking, uh, I have some great examples of that from, from over the years that we'll be talking about as, as we go on. So there's some course materials that we'll be referencing as we go along. I do have review questions for each of the, the modules and, and then some additional modules that we're not covering in, in this course because they're now dedicated to their own courses like penetration testing in, in industrial control environments, right? That's not something that you can just cover in an hour or two, right? That's a whole 40 hours of content and of, of itself. You know, so that uh, idea, but there's review questions. I have some quick start reference guides. So we'll talk about uh, primarily tools like Shodan and, and Nmap as well. So I have some quick start reference guides. You can find those in my GitHub repository. The link is in the, the end of this video. So don't worry about that. And then I always recommend that everybody at least read Sandworm by, by Andy Greenberg, uh, which is a great, it's a great novel. Uh, that talks about really the buildup of cybersecurity in the industrial control world. Kind of starts off with Stuxnet and, and builds up until it, I think that it was published up to a couple years ago. So also talks about really the lead up to the current Russian invasion of the Ukraine. Because Russia has always 
um, not been shy about leveraging control system cybersecurity attacks against the Ukrainians. Like when they turned out the power, they created two blackouts, one in 2015 and 2016, also one allegedly in 2017. And then it was just revealed last week that they also did it in 2022. So we've had three, if not four, blackouts in the Ukraine caused uh, by the Russians you know, using computers, right? It's that, you know, from that cyber perspective. So Sandworm does an excellent job of really walking us through like, kind of the history of control system cybersecurity. And it even talks about Rob Lee in the book and some others like uh, John uh, was Hillquist, I believe is how you say his last name, over at Mandiant and some others that that are some you know well-recognized names in, in the field. So Backdoors and Breaches is a also a card game created by Black Hills uh, Information Security. And there's a digital online version that you can use for free. And there's an ICS version that Black Hills had put together with Dragos, Rob Lee's company. And so we're actually going to look at that when we get into the last module talking about incident detection and response, because it's a great tool, especially when it's free and online, to be able to learn different types of attacks. And not just that, but how do we respond to those different types of attacks in control system environments? So we're going to be looking at that in the, the last module of the course. So speaking of the different modules or the different units, so of course we're here in unit one, so we're just going over the introduction, even though I put a lot of content into the introduction. So uh, we'll, we still have a little ways to go, uh, especially you know, just trying to get a lot of those resources that, that I want everybody to be aware of. In unit two, we're actually going to then get into really what is this world of control system cybersecurity and why it's important. We're going to dig into you know the different types of attacks and attackers and some of the history behind control system cybersecurity, especially over the last you know roughly still 20 years. When you look at Unit three, this is where we're going to, if you're not familiar with the different types of control systems. So when we think, we'll say things like PLCs and HMIs and RTUs and ICS versus SCADA, and the list can go on and on, but we're going to talk about what are those different types of control systems. And then we're going to look at, we also have specific types of protocols in control system environments. So it's things like Modbus and S7 and DMP3 and BACnet. And there's also wireless protocols like Zigbee, which I find the, the most fun to say. Um, you know, Wi-Fi, just like we have in our houses and uh, apartments and, and offices, right? You can also find in industrial control environments. And so you also find all the same vulnerabilities and security issues there as well. So there's a lot we're going to talk about in that section. And then once we get through that, I think we're all at that point on this level playing field, whether you come from IT or OT, and then we can start talking about, well, how do we secure our critical infrastructure? How do we secure our OT environments? So that first place we're going to start is with secure network architecture. So how do we allow IT and OT networks to talk with each other, but hopefully in a limited manner, but still wrap security around that to do it as securely as possible? Unit five, we're going to talk about asset registers, which is really just, if, if you're coming from an IT background, it's just a fancy way of saying asset inventory. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we have a list of our hardware and software and firmware that we have running in a control system environment. So we know we have, or we know what we have in the environment to protect. The asset register is, is very critical to a lot of control system environments. So they should already have one, even though, that's not always the case. So we'll also talk about how to build one, which isn't necessarily easy. And depending on the environment you're working in, it's not safe potentially as well. But it's very critical to have a asset register as complete as possible because then that lends itself to when we talk into unit six about threat and vulnerability management. Right? Understanding what vulnerabilities do we have in the environment and how do we need to address those? How do we address them? And, and do we even need to address them? So, so it's definitely a lot to talk about in, in Unit 6. In unit 7, we take a little bit of a sidetrack. So this is where we, we're talking also a little bit of penetration testing. 
and using tools like Shodan and other OSINT or open source intelligence gathering tools out on the internet to see, uh, especially, do we have any control system environments or systems that are connected or exposed directly to the internet? Because if they're exposed to the internet, no, they're exposed to everybody, including the attackers. And the attackers will find them, and they will find them very quickly to to target them and, and take control over those and then use them as a foothold into the rest of the OT or, or the IT environment, which they can then use to get into the, the OT network. So we're going to spend some time uh, there. And then after that, that's when we'll get into our last unit talking about incident detection and response. So when we look at network security monitoring, how do we detect if there's an attacker on the network? Right? We can deploy different tools to alert us. Well, how do we investigate those alerts to determine is something malicious or not? There's some alerts that I, I know if I had first seen them when I came into OT for the first time, especially 10 years ago, I would have said, oh, that's malicious activity. And it's like, well, no, that's just normal plant plan operations. <laughs> so so there's definitely a couple of things that we want to look at there. And how do we respond? Response at high level works very similar in IT and OT. We just have different focuses for that response. That's what we're going to talk about later. Especially the main thing to just keep in mind, not to jump too far ahead, is just in control system environments. In OT, right, the, the main concern is safety. Making sure the people at the side and in the the, gen, the the general public are safe, and then we also worry about the safety of the environment, and then we can talk about the availability of the plant. But that's very different than the IT world, where we're worried about confidentiality of data. Most importantly, right? We don't want attackers to come in and steal our information, and that's still important. But that's not at the top of the list when it comes to OT cybersecurity. It's the ultimate priority. Second to none is physical safety, making sure everybody on site goes home at the end of the day to their family, making sure that if there's the general public in, in the vicinity of that plant or wherever we're operating. Think of if we're operating a you know subway for moving people from point A to point B. And we have to make sure everybody stays safe. That is our primary concern above and beyond anything else. So that's what we're going to be talking about in those eight different units for this course. Now, I did want to include you know, a talk a little bit or a section around cybersecurity certifications. Again, they don't really fit in any of the other modules, right? but but it's one of the most commonly asked questions that I get. And it makes sense, right? And I have a lot of these cybersecurity uh, certifications. So I've taken the entire series that of the ISA 62443. I've taken the three SANS courses and, and three certifications. They have a couple other courses, but they don't have uh, certifications for those in, in the control systems. And then next year, they're going to debut a pen testing course, which I'm I'm excited. I'm going to go take that one. And then uh, there are some other certifications out there from other companies like Exida and I believe it's Tuv Rhineland from, from uh, Germany. I just don't have any experience with those. I know people that have taken those courses. Uh, so we'll mention that. Um, but uh, I just don't have any personal experience with those. So, so the most popular route I see people taking today is ISA 62443. So ISA slash IEC. So ISA and IEC are two organizations that think of them kind of as sister or brother entities. They, um, IEC is more internationally recognized. ISA is based out of the United States. So it just depends on what part of the world you're, you're from or you, how you'll reference it. And so ISA 62443, though, is really considered the gold standard of a literal standard of how do we create a cybersecurity program for a control system environment. Right? It's, it's a great framework or standard in doing that. And we're going to be talking about that a lot as we go throughout the, the course. So they put together four different courses. And if you... You do have to take the courses to take the associated certification exams. 
And you can see there's the first one starts with the fundamental the fundamental specialist. That's like kind of, kind of like Security Plus from the IT world if you're familiar. And then you can see there's there's three additional kind of more specialist type of roles. So one for uh, maintenance, of cyber security, uh, secure network design, risk assessment, which we're going to talk about risk assessments, which is a very key component or cornerstone of a 62443 program. And then if you get all four of those certification exams, you become what they call a ISA IEC 62443 cybersecurity expert. It does not make you an expert in anything. I hate the name, right? It takes you, what, 10,000 plus hours to truly become an expert in anything. You know, this is maybe, I think these are, you know, two to three days average, of course. I think most of them are two days. So you're not going to become an expert in anything in, you know, eight, nine or 10 days. So I think that the name is a little misleading and really the courses are mostly written for teaching cybersecurity, like IT cybersecurity basics to OT professionals. And they, of course, they talk about the 62443 standard as well. That's probably about 25, maybe 30% of the course courses, right? But again, it's just try to level set expectations, but it is the one that most people gravitate to, I think because it's the most widely recognized internationally, as well as like here in the United States. And it's probably the most cost effective because these classes, if you're an ISA member, which is like a hundred and I think what, $25 or so to sign up for again in US dollars. But um, the courses themselves, I think all four put together is like seven thousand dollars or i think they're like sixteen hundred dollars each um which might sound like a lot and i, and I get it, it still is is a lot of money but compared to the sans courses the sans courses now are are about ten thousand us dollars to take each class and the corresponding certification exam and they go up about ten percent every year so uh they could be a lot more by the time you know somebody's listening to this video down the road i hate to say but the gicsp is kind of their entry level into the control system uh, world i took that about 10 years ago it was a great course with justin searle and great class though uh, and the best thing actually for me it really wasn't even necessarily the content it was just i it, the room was, had about 100 people in las vegas 50 of us were from IT and 50 of us were from or, uh, OT. And so the best part of that class really was getting a getting to talk with different people from working on all these environments. And I remember there was a gentleman in the front row that asked this question you know, the first morning. It's just a really basic networking question. And I was kind of like, wow, I can answer that. I, I felt so smart. But then I realized it was just the way he asked the question, it just was a completely different way of looking at something. And I realized then it was, wow, IT and OT, right? We're, we're, we're looking at the same thing. It's just, we look at it very, very differently. So if you're coming from IT, we have to you know, learn to think like engineers and learn to look at things from the OT perspective or, or vice versa. Right? If you're coming from OT and automation, then learning how to look at things from that IT perspective. And then we can meet in the middle, and that's where we can do that. Or over time, we have people, like I like to think of myself, that now kind of have one foot in both world, worlds and can be kind of a over, kind of a, I see a, a overall you know cybersecurity practitioner you know from from both worlds and, and that's where we need to get to to truly protect our ot environments because remember the ot environments are always talking with it environments and almost every it environment is talking with the internet so there's a lot of risk so again that's what we're going to be talking about in this course is how do we protect those environments the great course to me is the best course you could ever take to learn how to protect OT environments. That's actually the class that Rob Lee actually wrote, and he still teaches it a couple times a year. So he literally is in class still teaching it. I took it um, in 2017, and when I was in class with him, it was when the Trisis incident was happening, and that was actually a, one of those big events in the industrial control world. So it was really fascinating that you know, some of us would go to dinner at night or have conversations on the side, and he would be sharing with us 
thing, a little play by play, um, you know, behind the scenes as what was going on. So and there'll be some things we can, uh, can share as, as we go along, but, uh, and even that class at $10,000, just if, if it's something that you could afford, I strongly suggest you make every, every, um, effort to go take that class with Rob in person, because to get really to sit in the room with the world thought leader in industrial control, cybersecurity, and be able to ask him questions is, it's priceless. So I'm thinking about just retaking it because it's been, it's been a while since I've taken it and it's, they've changed the course. They've just changed the labs. And again, just to be able to, to work with him and, and ask questions to have that. I mean, it's just it's still a, an amazing opportunity. And nothing against the other people that, that teach the class as well. I just, <laughs> 10000 is a lot of money. So uh, GCIP, I actually took that as part of my SANS master's course. That's uh, It covers the NERC SIP uh, certification uh, standard. So if you work in power transmission or generation in North America and Canada, then you your facilities have to be NERC SIP certified. And so the course really teaches about NERC SIP and it's mostly, I, I hate to say it, and I love Tim Conway who wrote the course, um, does a lot of, of work in power and helped investigate do, and the, the power outages in, in the Ukraine. Um, so it's a very important course for those that work in power the class, the the test itself though is it was really a, a test about auditing the the certification so not necessarily my my favorite <laughs> but um, you know Tim's definitely one of my my uh, favorite control system folks for sure and just like raw it's really great great people so so those are the three SANS courses again if you get the opportunity to take the course with Rob Lee, you it's still worth the ten thousand dollars if if you have it to spend. Um, and then there's the GICSP, which is an introduction. So a lot of people um, don't necessarily go that because I think at this point in time, there's a lot of content out there. They might feel like like this course. Maybe you don't need to go take the GICSP if you can get you know at least some of that of this course. Again, we're we're only doing 20-ish hours. Uh, we're not covering the 40 plus hours that you get out of the GICSP, but it's it's a start and it's free <laughs> compared to the ten thousand dollars. So. And then GSIP again is is for if you work in NERCSIP environments, power generation and transmission in, in the US and in Canada. So, there, again, there's a couple other certifications out there. I don't have any personal experience with these, but there's Exodus. We have engineers at, at the office that have some of these certifications. So um, they're lower cost. They're, they're more along the lines of the ISA, IEC courses. And I've heard um, you know, good things about the content. It's, it's like the ISA 62443 classes as well. There's, you know, they're two or three days. So they're not teaching you everything, you know, as compared to when you go to SANS. Because SANS courses are usually five, six days, and they they can run like 12 hours a day. So you know, with Exida and two Rhinelands, they're more affordable. And, and for the information you get, uh, what has been explained to me is it's good information. Again, it's not a super ton ton of information, but it's it's really solid information and it's more cost effective than some of the other solutions. So two of Rhineland, since they're based out of Germany, you see this a lot more uh, certifications for people in Europe, where I think Exeda is a little bit more US based. So that's usually what I typically will see. But And then just other training. So CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is based out of the United States, that's worked heavily with Idaho National Labs. So anything ICS, cybersecurity related, kind of in the U.S. typically comes out of INL. But they actually have free courses online. So there's not a, necessarily a certification that goes with them, but they do a lot of free training. And you used to have to do in person. I think you might have even had to be a U.S. citizen. But I think with COVID, they changed a lot of that. So they just opened it up pretty much to anybody to, to be able to take the courses. So also take advantage of, of those classes as well. So you can go to CISA.gov and, and find all the, the online courses. So the rest of the section, as we wind down, we're going to talk about just some additional resources 
and, and we'll be referencing a lot of these as, as we go throughout the other courses. But I did want to get them out uh, ahead you know, in the beginning of the class because mandatory reading, I tell everybody, if you're working especially in OT cybersecurity, well, one, you have to look at the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, the, the one on the left hand every year. That's where Verizon, now this is IT based. They look at all the IT networks and all the incidents and breaches from the previous year and look at patterns and looking for metrics to understand what's going on in that previous year. So how can we be better cybersecurity defenders? Well, remember, most IT or most attackers that get into OT networks come through the IT network. So it's important to understand as OT cybersecurity defenders, what's going on in the IT world. And then we also definitely need to understand what's going on in, in OT specifically. And so that's where Dragos comes in. So every year they do their year in review report. So same, same thing like Verizon for IT, but Dragos does specifically for OT. And so that's where we'll see with uh, specific to OT networks. And it's great information. We'll be talking about some of that as, as we go throughout. So where you look at think they you know some of the the content they mentioned if it's just off the top of my head but i remember something like uh for all their pen testing engagements like 70 percent of the time it's really easy for the pen testers to break into the ot network from from the it side of the house right which is which is concerning or that uh, roughly about 50 percent of the networks that they went into didn't have proper network security monitoring set up which is also very concerning because if you don't have proper network security monitoring set up, whether it's you have it at all or if it's set up but it's not done effectively, then how are you going to know if an attacker is in the environment? You're not. So you get a lot of interesting, fascinating information out there that you can use from a practical perspective. Because they say, oh, we're not doing this today, but, but we need to be. So a couple other resources. So there's some great podcasts out there that I listen to. Um, I'm actually now shifting myself over to the right because I started listening like Control Loop from Dracos. It's becoming a little bit more marketing these days, though. So not as practical, which is a little, little disappointing. So hopefully it changes. But um, there's the unsolicited response from uh, Dale Peterson, who he runs the S4 conferences that we'll talk about. Um, so he's always thinking about the future of control system cybersecurity. So what's coming next? What's coming down, you know, three, four, five years down the road? So I'll probably never be on his podcast because I'm I'm about protecting the here and now. <laughs> so sure, it's great to understand what's coming, but I, I want to get the job done today, not necessarily three or four or five years down the road. So uh, the C to say, or you see the it's Control System Cybersecurity uh, Association that's run by Derek Harp. Uh, they have a great podcast. They always have different practitioners from the field come in and, and talk um, every week so you can learn something about different sectors. So it's a really, really great show. That's kind of the same format that the other ones um, follow. So Waterfall um, or sponsors the Industrial Cyber, uh, Security Podcast that's hosted by uh, Andrew Ginn. And so I've listened to that one for, that's the one I've listened to for the, the longest and bring in different um, uh, guests to talk. I actually recorded my episode with Andrew uh, last week, which was really exciting. So I'm going to be the first guest of 2024 uh, when they released the, the podcast. So that was really exciting. Um, and then I was just on the Protect OT cybersecurity podcast as well from uh, Industrial Defender with uh, Aaron Crow. Uh, and, and that was another great conversation. Talked about how to get into get into ICS OT cybersecurity. Aaron has a, a background, kind of a little bit of IT, and he worked in power. His dad had worked in power plant plants. Uh, so it was kind of part of, part of his, you know, in the, in his DNA, but uh, sort of a lot of similarities in, in kind of our, our backgrounds. And we can kind of build off of that like shared experience, but different at the same time. So, so a lot of great podcasts, like I said, I'm leaning more towards now the protect OT and industrial security and then the, the C to say ones, just because I like to hear from all the different practitioners because they're just bringing real world experience and understanding, like, here's the practical tips of how you do the job, right? That's what I'm always looking for. So I think that's what I, I typically gravitate to. 
Uh, there's some great people to follow on LinkedIn and there's other social media I get. I, I just do LinkedIn now. Um, I say, that, you know, Rob Lee, which you mentioned, Tim Conway, who wrote Nurk Sip, and he's, he's, you know, huge in power, uh, also, you know, works, you know, kind of leads the ICS program at SANS with, with Rob I mentioned Dale Peterson at S4. He's you know, the guy that's always thinking about what's coming in the future. You know, and people need to do that for sure. You know, um, Derek Harp, who runs C to say, and then Leslie Carhart, they are uh, lead incident response, at least now, I think in North America for Dragos. So, so that's where they work. The, the one thing I was starting to think of is that some of these folks that, which are great, you know, knowledgeable experts in the field, they don't, they're not very necessarily active on LinkedIn though. So I also put together a, a link or a list of people who are on very active on, on LinkedIn. So I'm not going to read these to everybody. And I kept Rob on there and you can see Derek still on the, the list. Um, so you can see, you know, who's on both lists and kind of follow them. Uh, but I think there's a great representation from people, you know, all around the world, men and women. And so I think there's a really great diverse group here from you know, all different types of backgrounds. Uh, like Don Capelli runs OT cert for Dragos, which is a open initiative for, for especially mostly focused for small, medium sized uh, OT environments to come get free, free help. Um, there's a lot of great information out there. Um, you know, Tony Turner, who I've met through not only LinkedIn, but through, I remember when I went to S4 this year, finally for the first time, and in the forums where people just were talking about all these different you know, topics and questions before the conference, he was in there answering everybody's questions, like in every forum. <laughs> so I was really impressed. And you, you'll see, if you look him up, like on LinkedIn, he really is a a very knowledgeable expert in the community that just wants to help people like it, like everybody else here. So uh, definitely uh, check them out if, if you're on LinkedIn. Uh, conferences we wanted to mention real quickly. So uh, the one conference that I go to every year by far is the SANS ICS Summit. I think it's in March, May, or May, March, April timeframe. Now these days, it's just two days. Plus you can do the training as well. So like for another five days, but um, the two days is just um, going in for presentations. Rob and Tim Conway are co-chairs. And you see, of course, all the other SANS ICS instructors and other people in the community. I think this last year was what, five, 600 people probably, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, I think for me, the big moment probably for most people was they brought the, the CISO or the CIO actually from Ukraine Negro, which is the power company in the Ukraine. And he, he actually flew out to talk to, you know, these six, seven, 800 people that are hanging out at a conference, literally at Disney World. And then he was getting back on a plane to go back to the war the, the next day. It was pretty, pretty awe-inspiring. So I, you can probably tell I get a little choked up every time I think about it. So uh, S4 um, definitely is a great conference to see. I think there's about 12, 13, 1400 people that go there. Uh, it's probably one of the larger, you know, cybersecurity uh, conferences for control systems. Uh, and that's in Miami every year. And now I think, uh, the next one is in March, early March. So, uh, I'll definitely be there. I already got my ticket. So, uh, CS4CA actually sit on the advisory board for them. And so I'm really excited to get to go. That's going to be in, I think, Austin in, or Houston in uh, March 2024. So really excited about that. Uh, the ICS Village, they do a lot of different conferences. So they're at like DEF CON and Black Hat and, and some others. I'm trying to work with them to get them at our local B-Science, hopefully for next year, because we're going to have a, a track or an entire day dedicated for ICS OT cybersecurity. Uh, Dragos Disc, I went to Dragos. That's their one-day conference. It's mostly for clients and partners. So uh, And they, they present all of their research, which is really Really great. So it was really great and, and get to see a lot of people, get to see a lot of people I've met on LinkedIn for the first time in, in, in real life. So that was a lot of fun. So the local B-Sides conferences, they pop up everywhere. Like I said, I mentioned the, I run the, the local Greenville one. So a lot of, I talked at uh, uh, B-Sides Augusta in uh, Georgia not, not long ago uh, on, as you might imagine, industrial control cybersecurity. So you can find those types of events everywhere. So Cyber Senate are smaller events run by um, Jameson. His last name is blanking on me. He, But um, 
but you know, you get 50, 60 people, but really quality events and the people that are there are just absolutely amazing. Some of the best talks I've had with people, um, at conferences ever. So I've been really excited about those. Um, and then hack the capital, which kind of goes along with the ICS village folks, uh, or that's their, um, dedicated cybersecurity conference in DC. So, and there, there's some others definitely out there, but those are the big ones for me. And I'm definitely always at the SANS ICS summit and S4 now and CS for CA, and then try to get to as many of the other ones as, as possible. So, and then finally, <laughs> we'll get to the end. Uh, if you are looking for other resources that I put together, so I have mycolcom.com. That's kind of the main clearinghouse, I guess you can go to now for all the different links. I have a GitHub repository. That's where you can find all the references that we talk about in the, the course. And then also the you know, YouTube channel, which you're obviously watching right now. So I don't necessarily know if I need to list that out, but... Usually if I'm teaching this for other groups, it probably makes sense. So, and f the last slide, I also have a weekly newsletter. If you want to sign up, you can find the link on my website or, or on my, my LinkedIn profile. And it just comes out on Sundays. It's real quick, practical, like three quick things about here's my top posts from the week. Here's my, uh, here's a, maybe a top podcast I listened to or an article I you know, read that I thought was really useful. And, and that's it. Nothing, nothing crazy. So just things to, to help people. So, so that's it to finally wrap up the entire introduction. So like I said, I kind of throw, try to throw everything in the kitchen sink in the very end. But I wanted to make sure to highlight those resources before then we jump into the, the rest of the course and uh, start learning about securing industrial control environments. So thank you again for tuning in. And uh, I'll see you in unit two.